Assalamu alaikum. Um, from here, it's all English, I'm afraid. I'd like to talk to you um, about something very personal to me. It's a very, very personal experience, if I may share it. A um, little bit about positive thinking. Why, when, and how? Why do you eat food? Why do you drink water to stay alive? Yes? Why do you think positive? To live. Being alive and living are two different things. When do you think positive? Or should one think positive or have a positive mental attitude? Let me ask you this. When do you breathe? <sighs> all the time. So what I try to do is think positive all the time. It becomes a part of you and a part of everything in you in every waking second of your day. There is, in my mind, always something positive in every problem. How? Nothing is completely bad. This is just a fact of life. So, I'd like to share with you a little bit of a story about my life, if I may, before I go into the how bit of positive thinking. I spent my teenage years here in Sudan in the late 80s, early 90s, it was a tough time. It was a little bit of a tough time for the country. We uh, didn't have much. There was uh, fuel, lack of fuel problems. We didn't have petrol. Uh, it was a problem to get bread, milk, gas, diesel. It was just, that was just part of everyday life. But it was still a happy time. I, I don't understand how, but I have the best and happiest memories of that time. And I had experienced the lack of all of those things like everybody else, nothing different. But every problem somehow seemed to have something fun or something positive in it. I remember there was no fuel at all. At the age of 13, because I was quite responsible, my father one day says, here are the car keys, go and find some petrol. I thought, you know, I, what? Okay, thank you. Sure. This is good. But hang on a second. I said, this is fantastic. I get to drive a car. I was responsible. My father wasn't responsible, but I was responsible. And, all the, and there wasn't many people on the road as well. There was no petrol, you see? But here's the thing. For me, I thought, if, getting, if having no fuel means I get to drive a car at that age, fantastic. I hope we never get any petrol. You know, it's just a problem. So that's fine. Then... Over a period of time, you know, you start to realize that all the problems have something fun in them. You can get a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning. Some of you cannot relate to this. You were not even born. All right? So when I say there was no fuel, I mean the petrol queues were one kilometer long. Some of you will remember that time. Yes? So, but here's the deal. You can get a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning, fact, and someone will say, hey, there is some bread in a bakery in Khartoum North at 2 o'clock in the morning. So I was like, yeah, all right. And then you stand in the queue. <laughs> you know, this, the, the people clapping are the people that remember that time. That's why. <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun. You know, it was, it was fantastic. You, have, you, you go to the, you know, and then you go in queue. And then you get a little brick and you put it in the queue. And then you go and do something. And then you come back and go, excuse me, this is my way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You know, this is, this is just it. It was still a fun, happy time. Anyway, as a teenager, I was uh, quite hot-headed. You know, age of 12 or 13, I had a slight problem. I was getting in fights all the time. And it was because of something I realized today that people use uh, with loved ones and people they love at home. You know, many, many Sudanese homes here, this very thing that I had a problem with, they use it for fun, and they call it to each other. And the problem that I had, which people use lovingly and endearingly, was uh, one word, a very, very big problem for me. And it was, you go going behind and go, Halibi! Halibi! I was like, what? 
excuse me. So <laughs> now he, here's the funny thing. I'm telling you the truth. At 12 or 13, I didn't know what it meant, but I knew it was something bad. So I hear you, you know, so I thought, but then later, and then you get in a fight, you get arrested. My father has to come to the police station to take me out. It happens so many times. The local police knew me so well that when I come in, they go, there's your chair, sit, 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 it's okay. And they wait for him to come. Now, into the mid-teens, you start to develop a self-image and you want to work out and exercise and look good. So we started working out, exercising, basketball, football, bodybuilding, weightlifting, all of those things. There wasn't much to do. It was just a nice time to do all those things. So you start to get physically stronger. The problem is now, walking, and someone says, Ya Halibi! Now, here's the thing. I mean, for, for, <coughs> for the non-Arabic speakers, Halibi basically means whitey, or cracker, or gringo, if you're Latin. Or lobster, if you're British, you know, it basically they're teasing you. It's just a bit of, you know, they're teasing you. you. You know, they're saying you're different, all right? But you're really different, all right? But it's not a problem. So here's the thing. As you got a little bit stronger, I was continuing to get involved in fights. But now, I was causing more damage to the people I was fighting with. I was very, very, you know, short-tempered. So I was breaking noses and breaking ribs and breaking jaws. My father said, he is going to kill somebody. Best thing to do is, they sent me off to England to study. He said, this is the safest thing to do. Just get rid of him. So that's what they did. The funny thing is, 20 years later, almost 20 years later, when I came back to Khartoum, I'll tell you why in a minute I came back. But when I came back, I met a guy from Syria. Uh, not from the capital, from Damascus, but from Syria. But he was quite specifically from the region of Aleppo, Halep. Yeah? So this was the real Halep. All right? <laughs> so, uh, no, no. So, so here's the thing. And this guy, he's only been here two weeks, and he says to me, you know, I, I, I love, I love the Sudanese people. They have this amazing intelligence and intuition. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, they see you, they automatically know where you're from. I said, <laughs> I said really? What? <laughs> How? <laughs> I said, sorry, sorry. And I'm thinking 20 years later, you know. Sorry. Um, How, what, what do you mean? He says, what do you mean? I'm driving. I can drive in my car. And somebody will call. Halibi! Halibi! You know. He knows where I'm from. I said, like, oh, okay, all right. What do you say when he says that? He says, ah, of course, but uh, like, sure, uh, I bring a compliment. I, I return the compliment. I said, how? He goes, I call him back, Sudani, Sudani. You know, so <laughs> I said, all right, that's fine. If I knew that 20 years ago, it might have been a bit different. Anyway, the reason why I came back in 2005, the 2nd of May, 2005, at 11 o'clock precisely during the day, I was in London. I got a phone call. And somebody says, hello, it's family, yes, speaking. He says, listen, I am your dad's cousin. I'm your father's cousin. I said, can I, yes, can I help you? He says, listen, I don't know how to tell you this, but your father has just been killed in a car crash. I said, who, who is this? He says, I, I, I'm your father's cousin. What do you mean? He said, I'm sorry. It happened 25 minutes ago. Got hit by a lorry. Sorry, he's gone. Now, you know, my mom, my dad, my sister, my younger sister were living in Khartoum. And I said, ah, listen, where's my mom? Where is my mom? Does my mom know? Has somebody told my mom? And he said, well, I really don't know how to tell you this, but your mom was in the car with him. I said, what? Who is this? This is your father's cousin. I said, w w where is she? He said, I'm sorry, she's, she's, she's gone. They're both gone. I'm thinking of my sister now. She's 16. I said, listen, where does my sister know? Where is my sister? Does she know? Where is she? He said, <clears throat> I really don't know how to tell you this. But she was in the car with them.
I said, is she dead? He said, well, we don't know. She's in intensive care, and we don't know. Is she dead? No. Thank you. Yes. She's not. Now, I can't tell you, and I'm sure, of course, some people would have experienced that pain. I can't tell you what was going on here at knowing I have just lost almost a third of my family. But what I was thinking was, yes, thank you, God, that not all three have gone. One of them was still here. So, it's a tragedy, yes. It was tough, yes, absolutely. But here's the thing. They were going to go. Sooner or later, they're going to go. I'm going to go. You're going to go. Nobody's staying forever, guaranteed. Time and place unknown, but we're all going to go. He decides the time and place, one-way ticket, yes? So, it was a consolation for me. I was happy that they had gone together. They had lived together, loved each other more than anything I have seen in my life. And they went together. That day, for me, it was a wedding in heaven, as far as I was concerned. Now, my concern is my sister. She's 16. She's not, you know, I got to make sure that she's okay. Anyway, I fly back. And uh, she's now fine. She's just finishing a master's in Plymouth, uh, political studies, I believe. I'm not sure. But uh, she's perfectly healthy, perfectly happy. Now, here's the thing. I uh, thought in my mind from that day onwards that I must not just think positive. You see, having a problem as a teenager, something positive came out of it because I was sent away. I got to experience a new culture, a new education, and this was something positive that came out of a problem. Now we have this uh, family loss that we have, but something positive came out of it because my sister got to also get uh, uh, at least treated well and experience a new culture and a new education, and I got to come home. And this is what I like about this particular one. So, I have decided, how do I think positive all the time? I must link, I must link any problem to something that is an absolute. So let me explain. I thought, I'm absolutely sure that the sun will shine tomorrow. I am absolutely sure that if you jump in water, you will get wet. And you can be absolutely sure of a mother's love for her child, then you can be absolutely sure that there is something positive in every single problem that faces you. All right? Now, all you got to do is link it. Now, here's the deal. I thought to myself, this is not the right one, how do I train myself also? People, I, I love people. I like to learn from as many people as possible. And I thought to myself, you know, one thing, you have to learn from everybody, you know, man, woman, child. One of the things I've learned from, from uh, that, that women seem to have a slightly more positive outlook than us. I, I don't know how, you know, it, they, 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 they just do. Let me give you an example. I remember one day, um, a friend of mine and I, we went out and we went back to his house at three o'clock in the morning. His wife was waiting. Lovely lady, they're a beautiful couple. And uh, they, in their house, she's, she's always a very, very uh, sort of glamorous kind of lady and, you know, perfect hair, lots of mirrors everywhere. And, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, and, uh, and here's the thing. When we came in, I, she, met, she met us in the hall. And this is the hall, this is the door, and they have a very big mirror here in this hall. So... Three o'clock in the morning, he's standing there. I see this, and I hide behind him, just in case, you know, something could be flying. She said, and this is exactly what she does. She says, are you serious? What sort of time do you call this? What kind of man are you? You don't have a house? What kind of man? What is this? And then she's checking her hair. This is ridiculous. And I think, did she just check her hair while she was shouting at this? You see, a man would never do this. A man would never think positively to think, I better look good while I'm fighting. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You know? <laughs> it won't happen. 
I remember asking a bunch of my students one time uh, in the, the, the sports and fitness studio, and I said to the ladies, I said, what if you could have all the diamonds in the world, but never look in another mirror? And they went, excuse me? <laughs> no, thank you. All the diamonds, no, thank you. But the no, the mirror. Do you know why? Gentlemen, when a woman looks in a mirror, she sees all the diamonds that she could want and she could need. You understand? This is the difference. She is, she is the diamond. And I thought, and, 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 and they know that, but they might not be aware of it. So this is something that I have learned from the, the, the fair agenda. Gentlemen have a slightly, especially, especially, quite especially, young men in Sudan have a very, very rare, a rare gift that they have. This was too fast. <laughs> and here's, here's the thing. You know, guys, I'll tell you something. If you ever think you can't do anything or can't achieve anything, all right, this is one thing you are so good at, all right? I mean, <laughs> guys, it's true, it's true. Guys here will always succeed to get a smile out of a girl. And let's face it, girls in Sudan, it's very difficult to make them smile. Very difficult, very difficult. But when they do, it's like the sun is shining, you know? <laughs> and the guy is thinking, yes, I got her to smile. Everything is okay now. I'm getting married. All right, here we go. <laughs> you know? But here's the thing. I mean, gentlemen, I'll tell you something. If you can extract a smile, if you can extract one of the most profound human emotions out of somebody, you can do anything you want. Now, Something else that always helps me to think positive is to think of timing and to try and be on time for everything. Now, this is just, as I say, this is just my personal experience in life. I, in Sudan, we are famous for timekeeping. We, we keep the time, but we keep our own time. Nobody else's, you know, this, <laughs> it's our own time. Never the agreed time. When you go somewhere and you are already on time, you will feel positive about the place you're going to. I know it's a simple idea, but it works. So, and finally, Something that I find absolutely important in life is music. You know, we, we, are, we are party people. We are rabba. That's a rabba. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> okay? We are party people. We are not, we're not, you know, we, 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 we like to smile. We smile automatically. All right? And this is a part of us. This is a part of our culture. This is a part of our spirit. All right? The, the, this, is, this is the Sudan spirit, the Sudanese spirit. You know, we, 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 we like to sing, not shout. We like to dance, not fight. We are not war people. We are happy people. That's what we are. All right? This is the spirit that we have. So I'm going to tell you this. If, if you are able to have a little bit of music in your life all the time, and you're able to try and make it on time to as many things as possible, and if you can link something that is an absolute, like the sun shining tomorrow, like water will get you wet, like the love of a mother to her child, and link all of those things as absolute as they are, that you will always find the first positive thing in every problem, then your life will be good and happy. And I thank you.